Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Melissa Bennett. I'm curator of contemporary art here at the Art Gallery of Hamilton. I just want to take one minute to tell you how important this exhibition is to us to have John Scott and his works here. Um, he's been collected, his work has been collected by the gallery for decades. And the, we, the curators, present and past of this institution have long been admirers of his practice. And so this is a really big coup for us to have this huge solo show that gathers uh, a few decades worth of work, not to mention the Trans Am. And if you haven't seen the exhibition yet, if you had to walk quickly by it, we have some uh, views of the works uh, plus installation shots. And so I just want to warmly welcome both Robert and John and say that I was extremely excited when they both agreed to do this talk because the two of them are some of the most highly respected creative producers in the art world, not just here, but I would say the country and maybe the world. And I've followed Robert's, <laughs> I told him I was gonna make him blush. <laughs> um, I've been following Robert's writing and been a huge fan for many years and the same with John's work. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing them speak together. And Robert, I will tell you a little bit more about him, teaches art theory and criticism in the graduate program in the School of Fine Art and Music at the University of Guelph. He's also the senior contributing editor and film critic for Border Crossings magazine. He's published introductions, essays, and interviews to over 100 books and catalogs on Canadian, American, and European artists, and is a member of the Scotiabank Photography Award jury. He has curated an exhibition of recent drawings and paintings by Melanie Otier that will open at the Thames Art Gallery this summer and subsequently tour to six Canadian cities. In 2005, he was made a member of the Order of Canada. And John Scott probably needs very little introduction to many of you because you've found your way here tonight. And um, lots more information can be found in the exhibition catalog. But um, essentially, he grew up in Windsor and has been living in Toronto for 30 years. His practice is about 30 or 40 years old now. Um, and the images that you see here are quintessential John Scott. So the, cur the original curator of the exhibition, Daniel Strong, who originated the exhibition at Faulkner Gallery at Grinnell College in Iowa, um, has said that many of the works that we see made in the 80s look like they could have been made tomorrow. And that's a testament not only to his vision, but also says something about the times that we live in. And I think his works are becoming increasingly relevant, um, whether that is fortunate or not, but due to the state of the world today. So I will pass it on to our speakers. And um, we have them both mic'd. And we hope that both can speak up and it might be a little bit hard to hear, so we'll just keep an eye on that as it goes. Thank you very much for coming, so please give them a warm welcome. Um, thank you, Melissa, it, it, and, and, uh, and Lori for inviting me. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. I always like to come to uh, the Art of Hamilton because there are always interesting shows, uh, and that's the case now with both of the shows on right now, but I'm particularly delighted to be here uh, to talk to John. Uh, we, I did an official interview with him, it seems like 20 years ago now, and while we've encountered one another in various places uh, as both teachers and, and uh, writers and, and an artist, um, I haven't had a chance to talk with him uh, about his work for a long time. And in seeing the show again today, I'm reminded um, how important an artist he is um, and how good the work is, and how good the work has been for a long period of time. And it's rather extraordinary to see the, the trans -am apocalypse in the, in the metallic flesh. It's really uh, one of the great works of Canadian art, and indeed one of the great works of, of, the, of the 21st century, although it was made, I guess, in the 20th. So I'm really delighted to be here to talk to John, to try and pry from him uh, all kinds of things about what he's done in his practice, uh, a practice which is ongoing, it's also lovely to see new drawings upstairs. Um, the old work is now, I don't know, you're, it's canonical, John. You're like a living legend already, and here you are still making work. It's a real problem. So I, I, I guess I want to start. Um, I'm still alive. <laughs> I, I know. Well, and, and try not to die before the night's out so we can get this damn conversation <laughs> over. I mean, that's the whole thing. You know, um, Northrop Fry uh, said um, that if you ask about someone's identity, you don't ask, who am I? You ask, where is here? 
And so I want to get a sense from you about the importance of the here-ness of Windsor, the place where you were raised, and, and how you sense it might have shaped your sensibility and subsequently the art you've made because of it. Um, you know, I think the, probably the most important thing was the, thinking about Windsor was the, the siren that used to go off at noon on Saturday which went off, it was, a, it was an air raid siren. And it was, it was from Detroit, but it was so loud you could hear it in Windsor across the river. Um, it was just this terrific blast. And uh, it, it, it was always reminded me of, of uh, the kind of dread that sort of permeated ch childhood uh, in those years. Uh, those were the, the Cold War years, and uh, um, it was like living in a machine that was uh, a desirable target. Uh, that That's kind of the way I felt of it. About, about it, and it made me very happy to leave. Like it was a palpable f feeling as a child you had that this, that this oral key was a, as a way that it made you think about that the world was a dangerous place? Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, winter was a dangerous place. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, at least where I lived was a dangerous place. Um, it was, uh, it was also very close to a large factory, a foundry actually. And uh, I, I remember that uh, the room that I slept in would be illuminated sometimes by the uh, light of the foundry when they poured metal. Um, it, it gave a palpable sense of, of living in, in and being part of a machine. The machine, I mean, a, a bridge connected uh, one machine to another. I mean, you, in living in Windsor, you're, you're very close to, to America. Did, w was that shaping? Uh, I mean, was that what you were aware of on the other side of, of the river? That's what it was, that it was this place that was a, a dangerous place, a place that, that threatened not just you, but the world? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, you, you, were, you felt that you were dragged into a a scenario that uh, you really didn't uh, want to be part of. I mean, Canada was uh, thought of as, uh, at least the people in Windsor tend to think of themselves as, as uh, benign, pacifistic, uh, and, and screwed. You know, uh, because of that. Because of <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. yeah. Uh, it being a border city, there was a split consciousness. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the uh, Detroit was thought of as a very dangerous place, and it was. Mm -hmm. You um, you made occasional uh, furries. Sortes uh, into um, uh, on Saturday afternoons, you would go over and, and buy socks and Hudson's, <laughs> you know, and, and that was about it. You, you didn't spend much time really absorbing cu culture until 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 I was about oh, hit teen years, and then then the rock scene took over. And then you, you take risks and go because, because the, the, there was such palpable energy. Uh, you know, it, it was uh, no, no place had quite the rock scene that, that Detroit had. Is there a sound problem? I'm so sorry, but the speaker on this side is not working. So we're just going to stop and take a two minute break. Sure. So I truly apologize. It's going to take two minutes. If you on this side, you can hear much better if you come on this side. Because this speaker isn't working. 
So there's about 12 spots already here, and we're just going to move some chairs over. This is my relationship to technology, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> really? Technology always screws up on me. Is that true? Yeah, always. Ne never does uh, anything work perfectly for me. But that's interesting because, you, I mean, in, in your rage against the machine, you've, you've made the machine the, the vehicle for the rage. So, is, I mean, is that vengeance against all the technology that yeah, screwed you like around? Yeah, it's my toaster, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's fighting back, you know. It's it's not fair. Actually, there's a there's a, there's a, a real um, relationship between good and bad. If like, if I get a grant, I know that, that that something bad will happen to me immediately. Uh, and it, the good and bad are bad, physically balanced, like like. Uh, uh, Let's say if I go to sale, that usually means a, br a broken bone. Oh. Yeah. The, 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 there's this strange equation. It's, it's a, it, well, it's a, it, it would also predetermine you to see the world dialectically. And I suppose you could make an argument that your world is one in which the good guys and the bad guys seem to be fairly clearly defined. Or is that, is that too simple a reading of, of, of the coding of the work? Uh, well, it's, it's, uh, I'm probably basically a primitive person uh, who engages in magical thinking, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I remember seeing a car coming at me, knowing I was about to get hit by a car, and, and the immediate thought went through my head was, I got a grant. Yeah. <laughs> if there's anybody from the Canada Council here, you just remember this story. This is the story of Canadian art, that I got a grant, I'm about to be hit by a car. You know, uh, the, I raised that interesting question. Looking at this, uh, I, I'm not sure if it's in the show, I always forget what I see in pages and what I see in the flesh, but the, the dark commander who, who, who doesn't have an arm, the, 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 the traditional reading of, of, of a lot of your work is that, there, that there, there is a kind of evil there. But then you look at a drawing like that and you think, are we, are we being obliged or invited to, to consider that the commanders, that the darker side is also has a sense of vulnerability, that they're also to be looked at in a, in a more gentle and benevolent way than one would initially think? Oh, uh, yes, I, I think absolutely that... that um all of the uh, well, I, th I think the commanders, uh, some of them are, are pretty stalwartly, stalwartly evil, mm -hmm. pretty, pretty much into it, you know. Uh, but I, I didn't like. Uh, them being that that formidable, so I I, um, I I wanted I chopped the arm off one of them because I wanted him to, people to be able to identify with him like ne like Nelson uh, the profile she can switch very easily from uh, Napoleon to Nelson. Mm -hmm. Nelson lost his arm at, uh, I think, the Battle of the Nile. Uh, anyways, I, I wanted there to be sympathy for the character of the commander. I mean, is that a kind of sympathy for the devil to lift a line from the Rolling Stones? I guess it could be. I, I I hadn't really thought of it that way. I've never been a big fan of that song, for for some reason. But what I'm getting at is that the when, when you have a, a the, use the word evil in a title, I mean I mean it's it's kind of an it's a philosophical question. Do you actually believe in evil, or is it that oh what, yeah, as a as a kind of force in the world, not just what people do, but something larger and and providential than that, and and outside of. of of, as a force outside of human nature. Uh, well, I'll tell you, I, I, I think 
that's like magical thinking, mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, that there is this sort of uh, sort of thing like running around, you know, it got loose from the exorcist and it, it permeates uh, the world. It's, it's the only way, it's the only way I can understand certain things that I've seen in, in and of the world. And, uh, but yet, yeah, rationally, I know that human beings behave certain ways because of conditions that are forced upon them and, and situations that they're raised raised in and, and, and mature in. I mean, I don't think that, you know, uh, uh, you know, Bosnia and Chetnia were suddenly possessed by, by a dark and evil power. But there's a part of me that, that almost thinks that way. Yeah. Do you and, know what, that's interesting to me, I mean, you have a, are a Marxist, or at least you had a strong a sense yeah. of, of, of that as a kind of ideological and, and economic structure. I don't hear a lot of Marxists talk about magic. Well, no. Uh, it's not an accusation, but I'm, 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 I'm absolutely intrigued by the notion that... Uh, that at the core, well, I think most Marxists are, 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 are idealists. I mean, I wouldn't call myself a Marxist anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's something wrong with your heart if you're not a Marxist at 20, and something wrong with your head if you're still one at 50. <laughs> you know. Any 53-year-old Marxist in the room, you're welcome to leave. <laughs> No, but, but, but you coming out of Detroit to go back, sorry, coming out of Windsor to go back to that thing, one of your uncles was a, a, a hard-nosed uh, Marxist, wasn't he? Oh, Marxist? yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah. You, you, it's a tradition that you come to naturally from your Oh, upbringing. yeah, yeah. And he was a, a hardcore, he, he was very old. You know I, mean? I, mean, I, 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 I got to know him uh, when he was old, but but still uh, an incredibly vibrant man. And his uh, subscription to Marxism was definitely, you know, born in the uh, Russian Revolution. Yeah. We see, you know, he, uh, you know, still thought Trotsky was a great guy and, <laughs> you know, and, uh, uh, it's that, that idealistic uh, idea that, that man was perf perfectible, mm -hmm. uh, that, that it can, social conditions were changed, uh, that human beings were perfectible and society was, was transformable. And that, that's, that's still the way I, I, I feel about, about art. Art, uh, art is the, artists are the interior decorators of the form of ideas. Uh, they, uh, they don't do a lot. I mean, it's not like movies or books where, where you, you really can ch transform people, but but you can have a slight effect, like the way in which an interior decorator, you know, painting the floor pink has, has a subtle influence. Well, that's the way I feel that artists are, that they can have a subtle in, impact on uh, the environment around them, both by their work and by their but both by the objects they produce and by the work that they engage in. I've always been haunted by a, a line from a, a poem by W. H. Auden who's, when he says that poetry makes nothing happen. And, and my sense that he's not just talking about poetry as an art form, but he's rather talking about art, that in fact art yeah. isn't effective in, in making actual social change. There is the story of, of you seeing 
a, a, what, what is now actually hanging on the wall is a piece of art which was also a banner in a march that you saw that it could have some kind of galvanizing effect on people. It, it was, was that a, a kind of a road to Damascus moment for you that, that things that art could actually change people's thinking about the world? Well, you know, uh, I think the process of making it and being involved in, mm -hmm. in the uh, construction of, of it uh, is, is, can be an incredibly vibrant force. More, and the presence of art sort of hanging around, I think, is uh, can can have a real positive effect. Yeah. But but it's a, is it, is its effect equivalent or commensurate with the effect that stealth bombers and that the kind of technology that you draw in your work, that kind oh, of... Oh, no, of it's, course not. So, it, so what are they emblems of them? Are they emblems of our inescapable defeat in the face of that kind of power? That, mm. Oh, God. I, I, that's a toughie. Uh, I mean, I don't want to give up on, uh, on arts uh, ability to transform but uh, there's, you know, a lot of the, the drawings that I do are are very much like, like uh, like a kid playing around. Mm. You know, they're fun, and uh, uh, that's part of. Uh, the whole uh, the whole shlemiel, you know, that uh, that the making and and the production of it is all produces a, a kind of climate where where there's less chance of. Um, more uh, uh, the instruments of war, the instrumentality of war being used. So when I look at that love, extraordinary drawing of yours, of the, the Icarus one, with this, this piece of technology heading towards the, presumably the sun, the narrative you picked up on is the narrative of Icarus who adopts a technology in the wings, and then, of course, because its vanity flies too close to the sun and perishes because of it. When I look at that drawing I get the, and, and the name Icarus, I wonder, is, is, that, is that Icarus flying toward, is, is there a sun that can knock it out of the sky, or is that, in fact, really a rendition of power that, that is outside the realm of that I, I think it's outside. The, I don't think you have to worry about it melting. Yeah. I think it can take care of itself. <laughs> Well, that's the trouble, isn't it? I mean, yeah, those things take a, yeah. care of themselves. I mean, that's. So, I mean, it's not. A, it, 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 I'm, I'm, what interests me about your work is that it, it has this quality of. It's not that you aestheticize the, the technologies, but, except that I think they're beautiful drawings, but they all, the, the, the subject always seems to escape any ameliorating effect we might have as human beings on it. So it always seems emblematic of a kind of power that we're victimized by all the time. And I just wonder how you, as the, as the maker, thinks about the fact that you're making images that are gorgeously indestructible. Um, well, they're only gorgeously indestructible within inside the frame of, and, on, and on the bit of paper. They're, they're not very... Uh, they're truly not indestructible. They're 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 more of an indestructible spirit, uh, which I think is which I think pops up in in people all the time. Uh, uh, there's always a sort of joyful play mm -hmm. in the production of art. 
at least uh, I, I've always found it so that um, Well, there is a kind of boyishness about some guy who takes a Trans Am and motorcycles. I mean, these are boy toys that you yeah, turn yeah. into, again, emblems of, of both power destruction and, and, and uh, seduction. I mean, are you as seduced by those objects as we are as viewers? Oh, by them? yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, 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 uh, they, uh, they're completely seductive for me. I, I can't, I mean, I, I love looking at them. I love playing with them. Um, but on the same hand, I, 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 I like bunnies, you know. <laughs> uh, and I like fuzzy little bunnies and, and flowers and, uh, uh, I'm a terrible suck in a lot of ways. But th did now did the bunnies come out of your working in a lab a laboratory where animals were being used yes, in absolutely. experiments? Yes, yeah, that's that's tr that's a true story. That that, that um, I used to work at the Ramsey Wright Building at at U of T, where hundreds of rabbits were experimented on uh, daily and and atrocities were committed on them, yet it required uh, a, a kind of rearranging of thought patterns to allow people to do these kinds of things. I mean, obviously, that you know, we get cures for Alzheimer's and things like that because of the experiments on, on those animals, but still, it, it, to be able to do that, to be able to inflict pain uh, remorselessly. Uh, uh, what happened was uh, I, uh, I moved in with a, a woman and her child and suddenly I, there was, I moved from doing purely uh, uh, mechanical uh, instruments of, of speed and, and destruction to wanting to do something that, that would touch the heart. And, the, and I found that the bunnies could, could do that, that they were a way of addressing human it sounds funny to say that I, I drew bunnies as a way of addressing human problems, but that's, that's kind of the way it worked. I never asked you before, uh, what, did, did, uh, had you been looking at Jonathan Borofsky's work when you first come up with the bunny? No, I hadn't, actually. You know, he has a figure that, that there's a figure that's... It's very similar. Very I know similar. I, I saw that afterwards, but, but, you know, there tends to be... Uh, a lot of um, waves of uh, of images that pass through the art scene, like there was a period where there was logs were everywhere. And there was like <laughs> the log jam, and then there was the housing pro project. You know, where everybody was drawing houses, and it, it, it's it's just it's it seems like themes. Uh, become predominant. Uh, I I wasn't the only person doing doing bunnies. Uh, there were a lot of people that were doing them. But well, Callahan was doing them, the sculptural versions of them, but they were very comic as well. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Did you did you ever feel an affinity with an artist like, and and I think of it in two ways, um, Nancy Spiro, because she also had oh, characters yeah. that that became part of a kind of working repertory company that she could reuse over and over again, and she was also a deeply political artist. You yeah. were a political artist who was also had characters that it seemed you began to 
instrumentalize as yeah, characters well, you could use. I had a repertory of, 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 of images that, that could be worked and used in different ways mm -hmm. to address different issues, you know. Uh, um, uh, you could change them slightly uh, and address a different issue. Uh, when uh, when the, the Soviets started testing uh, nuclear weapons again, um, I started doing uh, funny drawings, only doing them in with doing them with blood. Uh, um, just a little bit of my own blood, but enough to give it a, a creepy feel and to um, give it an edge that it didn't normally have. You pushed the edge thing about as far as any Canadian artist had when you actually took a section of your own skin, had it surgically removed, and then in a sense embodied as a, like a reliquary, but it was a, clearly it was a reference to well, the Holocaust. It was, well, yeah, it was tattooed first. Yeah. Yeah, and then, then removed. Uh, yeah. Did that seem a radical thing to do at the time, John? Uh, yeah, but oddly enough, um, it, it's funny. Uh, I was going through a period where uh, a kind of slump where uh, I think it was, if I pulled my head off on stage, nobody would have noticed. It was, it, there was... Uh, <laughs> they would hear, by the way. It's a yeah, much more sensitive crowd. You yeah. Know. Anyway, Cronenberg's done that, I think. You know, and yeah, it's, it's actually, already been done, yeah. yeah. That's right. But uh, uh, the, oddly enough that when that, the reliquy went ra rather unnoticed uh, and like like the v first version of the car went re relatively unnoticed. But when you first showed it though, it, I remember it created a, a fair stir though. I mean it was considered pretty impressive then. When you say it got no notice, what it after initially showing it, it sort of it showed at the power plant and it immediately di di disappeared. It never was, nobody ever asked to show it again or reproduced. It only got one line in, in the star and, and a tiny little image and that was it. Oh. No, it didn't get any image at all. <laughs> but it did, get, it did get one line and that was it. And, and then it rotted away. And, and eventually was basically cubed and it was yeah, destroyed, cubed, is that yeah. right? And, and, and then had to be re, refabricated again when, uh, uh, when a chance came, when a curator approached me about showing it uh, about 10 years later. Uh, um, actually, they, they didn't approach me about showing the the, uh, the car. They, they approached me about showing some big drawings, and I said, no, I'd rather do the car again. And it had, it had been so long that uh, I felt that there was a space for it. So that's how it... That's how I came to do it the second time. So that's the National Gallery one, and then of course is the one that is here is the one for, that the Art Gallery of Ontario has. Right, right. yeah. So, so it's been through three iterations. Yes, three three times. Is there a graveyard where you go to get Transans or something? I mean, how do you find <laughs> Transans? There's, there's lots of them out there. Really? Yeah, they were an incredibly popular car. Uh, a certain age of... of uh, they were a rite of passage, I think, having a Trans Am. Um. Now, I got to look, I got to, uh, here's a quarrel I have with you. With the, All the Trans Ams I remember didn't have 
dice on hanging from the rearview mirror. No, they didn't. So what is, what is what is that some kind of fetish thing with you with you? Like what's with the dice? That's the que that's the integral question. I get the orange peels in the back and the gum wrappers, but I really don't understand the die. Uh, well, t I don't know who put the dice there myself. <laughs> <laughs> they were just that, the devil, the guy on this side of your shoulder said, yeah, put the dice in? Okay. Yeah. Well, that's a good excuse. Yeah. Uh, like, uh, I, I'm not that real fan of dice. Uh, fuzzy dice, I think, are kind of passe. Uh, I, I would have liked a lot of other things dangling from it, but... Uh, uh, we probably shouldn't go there. Yeah, I shouldn't yeah, go there. No, that's probably that, that, although there is the tumbling dice, you know, it's the Rolling Stones again. I, I, is that better than Sympathy for the Devil? Yeah, okay. I like it okay. better. Okay. Yeah. What, totally. the, the, the thing that's obvious about, I mean, there's a lot of things. I think it's a, one of the great pieces of art. But the obvious thing about it is that it, it, it is both object and text. And it seems from the beginning you've been extremely interested in the relationship between image yeah, and text. Why, have, why, is, why has language played such a, a major role in your work? Well, ever since my first sort of interest was to be uh, a science fiction writer. That's when my brother grew up to be a scientist and uh, and so I felt like, well, that's, that's taken. So I, I, I want to, I'll be a science fiction writer. And so I, I grew up wanting to write. Uh, and uh, there was always a literary interest in, uh, I, 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 went to uh, art school with the idea of becoming a politically correct uh, art critic. Thank God you didn't do that. Yeah. We, what, what, we, what, we've got, actually, we don't have a lot of politically correct art critics. We don't have a lot of art critics at all in Canada. So you, it, there's still, you know, if you decide to give up being one of the best artists in the country, you can always become an art critic. Yeah, uh, scraping out, out right? <laughs> <laughs> the book of revelations. Oh, yeah, I know. yeah, you didn't do that alone, right? The first one I did absolutely alone. No kidding. I did, uh, did completely alone, and uh, and I got it done in about two and a half weeks. The second one I got help, and it took me about two months to do. You do. And then the third one, I hired people, <laughs> and it took me about four months to do. <laughs> For you 53-year-old Marxists in the room, there's a lesson there as well. That's astonishing. You, you did that first one in two weeks? Yeah, it, it, it's not as hard as you think. Well, it's what, 22, is it 21 chapter? I, I, I'm not real good on the Book of Revelations. I try and stay mm -hmm. away from... Well, yeah. I forget myself, but... But, you, but, and did you... Now, by the way, why is it important? The Bible in the car is, it's a St. James version, which is the great poetic Bible, but it's a Gideon version of the St. James, right? Yeah. Why, why does it have to be a Gideon version? It's the only one I had. You know, you, you spend all of your life wanting to be an art historian. You think you're going to ask a question that's really going to get some insight. You find out because it's the only damn thing you had. It's not like it's, there's, that's that's not the reason. Okay, it's it's the, it's the truth though. It was yeah, the only one you had. Okay, but it could have been a Vulgate. And if it were a, see if it were a Vulgate, as somebody raised in a Catholic tradition like I was, that I could go for for years writing about the Vulgate Bible in your car. Well. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm sure you're happy I'm not doing that. Why has drawing been so important? Um, because it was what you started with, was it? When you yeah, um, because it was immediate and accessible. Yeah. Uh, painting seemed... Um, I started off doing... Uh, little sort of napkin drawings that had writing and uh, and uh, little bits of writing and, and images all mixed together. Were you thinking them as as art, or were they just? I mean, 
an activity that you were doing? They were, they were, I thought of them mainly as an activity, and then, then uh, Gary Dalt asked me to be in a show, and uh, all I had were these tiny little drawings, and I said, I can't be in a show, I don't do any art. And, and then I thought, well, I can blow them up, why not? Just make them bigger. Oh. That was it. So the decision to shift scale like that was was wasn't it wasn't about the power of the image. It was just that you had to have an image that was that could hold the wall, could hold the space. Yeah, yeah, uh, literally it was. Uh, and and then I made a kind of decision that um, the art that I saw being most powerful was was uh, sort of heavy metal sculpture at the time, like Richard Serra and and Donald Judd and people like that. And I, I wanted to create drawings that could compete. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I thought, well, they, these have a text behind them. They're not, uh, these, these sculptures have an immense textual uh, abutment and uh, so I thought well I'll just put snatches of text mm. in into uh, right onto the drawing. But your use of text is different than say Kasuth or oh, Lawrence yeah. Wiener. I mean the conceptual guys using language was to was to get away from object. You, you, language for you is 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 com equivalent and, and descriptive than it is. Oh, that's drawings. right. Yeah, okay. it, it's an object within and of itself. Uh, but again, it was, it was uh, doing the best I could with what, yeah. what was available to me. Uh, I, I liked the way it looked. Yeah. You know, it went well with the image. You know, Jean-Dominique Ang, the, the, the French, uh, 19th century French painter, I think he's 19th century, uh, said that drawing was the probity of art. And, and by that he meant it, that drawing was the conscience of art. Yes. In, in that sense, I, 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 I think of you as it's a conscientious soul. artist. It's the soul, kind of. of uh, uh, there's a reason why drawing comes first, uh, mm. you know. Um, it's it's the soul of painting. Uh, I mean, I've tried my hand in, in painting a little bit, and and found that uh, there's there's certain things to painting, but uh, I, I I like drawing because it is, you know, it's like the core. Mm -hmm of the core of the matter is, is in the drawing. D drawing also, uh, for, for historical reasons, has escaped the problematic issues that painting has had to deal with, and the whole idea of painting being the primary medium and exclusion and all of that. Somehow drawings managed to escape. It, it, it has seemed a more democratic art form. I don't know if that's a, a, a fancy conception. Oh, it is, of course. And, I mean, almost anybody can can do a drawing. Uh, you know, there's, I mean, chill, that's why children's drawings are so, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, meaningful, so, uh, uh, oh, I don't know, they just work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you know when when you're? How do you know when you've done a good drawing? I mean, I, I it's, it, it, is is it something that instinctively you understand? Is it a a, a more formal uh, recognition? Is it a, a like what what's a good? How do you know you've done a good drawing? Uh, well, when it's informal, uh, that's sort of what, when I know I I think a drawing is good. It has an informal quality of being able to touch people. 
So there's something direct that goes from the surface and the apprehension of the image to the eye and into the the soul of the person. That's the transaction that's happening in drawing. For yeah, you? yeah. There's an immediacy that that works for people. Also, you know, what I really like about about the art, what I consider a successful art, piece of art, is. Um, when somebody stands in front of a, a work of art of mine and says, I, my, my seven-year-old could do that. But they can't, that's, yeah, that's crap. You know, you should well, just... Uh, you, well, well, no, because what they're really saying is, I could do that. that and of course, that's not true either. <laughs> Uh, you got any more lies you want to tell to these people? I mean, we can well, no, lie all night. No, no but, but I think that's great because that's uh, saying I, I have the creative spirit within yeah. me and, and it, it lies uh, un, untilled, you know, but it's, it's there. And that, that I think is really good. Uh, I think... That's why I always like Patterson Ewan's work. You, people look at it and mm. think, oh, I could do that, you know. But of course you couldn't. It would be impossible to do. It's a question you know, of what of motivation. There's a, 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 a beautiful line, again, of Auden about William Butler Yeats, and he said that mad Ireland hurt Yeats into poetry. And I wonder if, if did, did Mad Windsor hurt you into drawing? I mean, is there some kind of way that, the, that where we come from has, in some senses, has caused a sufficient pain that it becomes a provocation to make us do something? Yes, I think so. I, 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 uh, yeah, I really do think you really did. One final, I came down with a colleague and we were looking at the drawings in your room and she looked at the, that beautiful one called Today, which is that piece of technology. It's a smaller drawing in one of the galleries here. And when she looked at it, she, her description of it was very beautiful. She saw that, that underneath the surface of the black, there seemed to be a lot of blue. And she said it was like looking at the feathers of a crow which is kind of a lovely way of thinking about it. But what it made me wonder is, when you describe something as mixed media, what, what is the mix? I mean, what is the media very often in the drawings that you're using? Oh, God. Whatever's within reach. <laughs> <laughs> you know, literally. Uh, um, it's what's within grass. So it's actually not planned. You don't say, okay, this, I'm going to do a graphite drawing, and I'm going to mix and caustic with it. It's not that kind of thing. It's just... Uh, well, I, well, I go out and I buy some graphite, and I buy some, you know, some wax and, and oil sticks and things like that. And I have them around. But a lot of it is just what, what's hmm. within the grass. It settles the order of uh, of application, and and is the is it's an old fashioned notion that that we make art out of the muse. I mean that's it tends to have gendered the idea of creativity. But what's what's the generative thing for you? Why is it you keep drawing? I mean why do you, you seem never to get tired of it. You continue to produce remarkable drawings after some forty years of doing it. I mean. Uh, do you get tired? Um, oh, yeah. Do I ever get tired? <laughs> uh, I, um, but not really. When, when you get a good drawing, boy, uh, there's a real spark that, that hits, you know. You know, might not... Do, I might not do ten a day, but but if I get one or two, that's that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. You know, there there's 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 physical limitations of the body. You know, that that are just part of you know the natural aging process, I guess. But. Uh, uh, 
when you when you hit one that's that's on, right on, you you really know it, and there's a joy uh, that. Uh, The, the, I think all, all artists kind of feel it. I, I, I think that they might grumble and gripe about it, but I think when an artist succeeds, the, there's a, a very specific kind of joy mm -hmm. that uh, all, all human beings are capable of feeling in one form or another. That all that I, I was all I, it it moved me tremendously when Leon Golub, who was married to Nancy Spear, was the other great political artist of the 20th century in lots of ways. When he got too ill to to do his large paintings on the right. wall with me, he 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 started doing small drawings, eight and a half by ten, and made some of the most remarkable work of his career when he was too old to do anything else. I guess I'm simply saying that is the commitment to the making of something, regardless of the yeah, physical circumstances, right. they, they was the real deal. Yeah, uh, yeah, I always thought it was, I always thought it was a shame when he came down off the ladder, but he did some beautiful stuff. Uh, it was small and, and but you know, they, they're, they're still as powerful mm -hmm. as, uh, it's some of the big ones. Yeah. Well, we can end with Yeats. You know, Yeats says, I must go down where all the ladders start in that foul rag and bone shop of the heart. So I, oh, guess, yeah. I guess you're going to stay with it, eh? Yeah. Anyway, th join me in thanking um, this gentleman for, for putting up with my impertinent questions. And I think that the deal, actually, Melissa, you have to tell us what the deal is. We have no idea what the hell we're doing now. Um, we'd love uh, is to there a tour of just people can see the show, right? So we'd love to give a couple minutes to questions, just if anyone oh, has good. questions now. And then we can all move into the exhibition space and, and John and Robert will come, so if you have any questions in the space as well. But are there any questions about the talk? And first of all, thank you very much. That was a really interesting conversation, and I think everyone agrees with it. Amanda. <laughs> What's it actually like to scratch all that text on the card? Does it make a horrible sound? Does it give you the heebie-jeebies when you're doing it? Yeah, it does. <laughs> it, sometimes it's like, like on a Blackboard. paintboard, like a chalkboard. <laughs> it, it can be pretty awful. It's not the most fun. Anything, anything that hand and scissors, and all, uh, 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 screwdrivers, every uh, a knife, a fork, anything. Yeah, I'd wear things down pretty fast. You know. Uh, the, the polemic and um, existential trajectory is incredibly, I mean, it's, it's, your work is going at incredible velocity, just like uh, Leon Golub's work, and, and I hold you both in incredible high esteem. Um, and, and what I'm about to say, I think, applies to all artists, but in particular, you and he are perfectly flawed. And, and I think your work is e extraordinary, and thank you for that. Um, with regard to the uh, the, the uh, fearful symmetry work that's in in the other room, uh, in the didactic that makes reference to the book of Job, which is an interesting story of of uh, divine darkness, and I was wondering if in fact that was something that was just uh, is that something that you had in mind when you did that particular work, or um, I'm just curious in in that reference in the didactic. You know, I, I got to admit I'm curious what you just said. I didn't, couldn't hear anything. I'm sorry. No, it's um, maybe uh, is the it's sound. Some, I don't know why this. This my hearing is lousy. Yeah. So. In, in the, uh, the the fearful symmetry work in the other room, um, I really enjoyed reading the didactic, the reference to the Book of Job. And the book of Job is interesting in light of it. It's a story of divine darkness. And uh, I was wondering if, in fact, that was a, a reference that somehow came forward.
forward in your conversation with, with whoever wrote that didactic? Or um, I guess I'm just curious about that particular story as I am with regard to the revelations and, and the, uh, uh, the apocalyptic trans am. Oh, well, it, it was like, there was a lot of book, the book of Job written into that, the, the Trans Am. It was, the, it was kind of, uh, uh, it felt like the book of Job. <laughs> uh, it, um, you didn't have to ins inscribe the text. The, 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 no, the no, making it, the piece was the book of Job, wasn't it? Yeah, it, it was like a, a physical embodiment of the book of Job, the, the scraping of it on, on it. I was also, it was, the second one was, uh, uh, I had just uh, started to develop uh, osteoporosis, so I was, I was in a lot of pain, but I was determined I was going to get the, uh, get it finished. So it, it was qu quite a jobish, <laughs> it, was, it was a real job, yeah. Thank you. I was thinking today, uh, what, a, what an incredible show, if you did a show of John's work, Nancy Spiro's and William Kentridge, you could do a drawing show that would be probably the, the most extraordinary series of drawings you could imagine. It'd be pretty interesting. Somebody should do Melissa can do that. Well, I, I have one quick question, by the way. The Innocent Pope. The, 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 it, uh, oh, the, yeah. the, the Innocent Pope, the, I mean, it, the, the original painting of Pope comes out of Alaska. It's Francis yeah. Bacon picks it up. Yeah. You pick it up again. But you put him in a wheelchair so he's sort of crossed with Stephen Hawking or something. Is that another example of you rendering the... Well, he's in Dr. X's uh, uh, wheelchair. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see. He's in... Uh, if you're... Uh, 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 not, not the Mysterians. What are they called? X what? X-Men? The X-Men, yeah. He's, the lead. he's Dr. Xavier. So he's just as bad as the... Uh, no, he's good. He's, he's good. He's really good. The wheelchair redeems him. Uh, the wheelchair is... Uh, I, I don't know. A mixing of characters. So does frailty... Is, innocence, then, is, is, is a way of, of creating... the. Frailty, or frailty makes innocence? Is that how it works? Well, no, he's not frail. He is Dr. Xavier, Dr. X. Yeah, I don't, I, yeah, I don't, I don't. Has tremendous, uh, he's the leader of the X-Men uh, because he has this tremendous mental power, yeah, you know, so uh, he's, uh, He's a, he's a, a good guy. So you still are a kid. You're still just these are just grown up comics. Yeah. A lot. Oh, there's elements of comics uh, in in my work all the time. Yeah. I still I still buy comics. Yeah. Oh really? Yeah. One last question. Yeah. Can you try it a little louder? He, 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 um, he said, he, he, in looking at the work, he saw that a lot of the work is in a kind of ambiguous void. And he wondered if you, if, if you could uh, amplify your thinking about the space that the, that the figures are in. Is that what it is? Well, they're, they're in the ambiguous void of the page. You know, the page is... is and the reason children are drawn towards drawing is is because it's it's a space where they they're they're omnipotent. They can make anything happen, and you know they they do. Uh, 
uh, any event can occur. So uh, that void is the universe, the universe of the child, the universe of the artist is, is uh, a place where anything can occur. So uh, uh, that's as close as I can come to describe. <laughs> We're going to move into the galleries now so you can have a bit more time with the work. The only thing is that you have to leave your drinks here, sorry. Um, but let's thank John and Robert one more time for being here.